Uh, today we are going to talk about sequential dynamic, sorry, not dynamic, sequential quadratic. sequential quadratic program. So once again, I want to solve this problem. I want to minimize f of x. dx is less than or equal to 0. I'm going to extend it to uh, the h of x case uh, in a little bit. Yeah, we'll extend it to h of x case in a little bit. x is in Rn. That's the problem I want to solve. Well, let me put h of x equals to 0 also. The goal for, uh, so remember what we did in the barrier method. So in the barrier method, we didn't have equality constraint. And then we only had inequality constraint. And this could be any convex set. So we were not really solving a problem in Rn. Uh, and we wanted points to satisfy strict inequality constraint as well. And that was the requirement for barrier method. For the uh, method of multipliers or uh, augmented Lagrangian method, the one that we were talking about in the previous class, uh, we had the equality constraint and then we extended it to the inequality case as well. Um, but even in that particular example, this thing was, uh, it can be any convex set. So of course, Rn definitely works, but you could pick any other convex set. And you can still apply uh, the augmented Lagrangian method. Uh, today, what we are going to do is, uh, we want to convert this in, into an unconstrained optimization problem. And in fact, what we will do is, we will try to solve a problem of this type, where p is a penalty function. And this x is in Rn. And in the process of solving problems of this type, we will eventually end up solving uh, We'll, we'll be able to find the optimal solution to this particular problem. Okay. So how should we construct the penalty function p of x? And how should we pick the value of c? Okay, so that's the two problem we need to uh, discover today. We need to discover the solution to those two problems. So how do we pick c? How do we pick the penalty function p of x? So it turns out that the penalty function p of x is going to be max of 0 g1 of x gr of x absolute value of h1 of x absolute value of hm of x. That is the penalty function we'll be working with. And let me give you the result right away. So after one hour of derivation and painstaking bookkeeping, we'll arrive at the following result. So x star is optimal, is a minimum, and satisfy second order sufficient condition for this problem for this problem one. Uh, 
we also want it to be a regular point. X star is a minimum uh, regular point. And X star is regular. If C is greater than summation J mu J plus summation I lambda I and notice the strict inequality here. C has to be strictly greater than that. Then X star equals to argument Fx plus C Px, X and Rn. Uh, sorry, true for, for any choice of x of f of x. True for any choice of f of x. <laughs> okay, so we have this result. The result is proven in the book, but it's a very complicated and time consuming proof, so I'm not going to cover it in the class. But now that we know this result, now that we know that this x star is actually argument, an unconstrained argument of this particular function, we now need to come up with two things. So when I'm starting the optimization, I really don't know what mu j and lambda is going to be like, right? So I don't know what this value is. So I don't even know what value of c I need to pick. So I don't know how to pick the value of c here. However, there is another problem. Uh, even if somebody told me, let's say God told me the value of C I need to pick, which is strictly greater than all of these values. Uh, this P of X, if you can see, there is a maximization operation here. So it is a non-differentiable function. So I can't really solve this unconstrained, or at least at this point of time, it's not very clear how do we solve this unconstrained problem. What do you think? How will we solve this problem? How should we solve this problem? Didn't we show in the last lecture how to change a maximization function to uh, equality constraints? Maximization function to equality constraint. Oh, uh, you mean like max of zero gjx equals to zero? Yeah. Uh, right, so that was in the constraint. That We put that in the constraint. So now this is in the objective function itself. Uh, is it possible to make some equivalent Px similar to the max, the first lie, but differentiable? Uh, yeah, that was your midterm problem. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you can do that as well, and you can make this uh, uh, make this a differentiable problem. But then the problem is you don't know if this this particular function, uh, this fact still remains for that particular p of x. So this p of x works only for, I mean, the statement only works for this p of x. But definitely that's one way to solve it. You can do log sum x and then you can use that for optimizing it. Any other thoughts? Let's go back to the fundamental. What exactly? I'm standing at x. I need to figure out where I need to move next. What should I do to figure out the descent direction? What have we been doing so far in order to find out the descent direction? Gradient. Sorry? Gradient. gradient, right? So I need to find out the gradient of this. Uh, okay. How do I know what, 
what gradient, what d to pick. So. Right, so I need to find D. Such that FF X plus D plus C P of X plus D is less than F of X plus C P of X. Okay, so I need to find this kind of D. Let's say D is small, okay? If D is small, then I can do the first order Taylor series expansion. So at least this expansion is easy. How do I do the first order Taylor expansion of P of X plus D? So this is my P of X. How do I do the first order Taylor expansion? So let's, let's write it down, okay? Plus C max of zero G1 X plus D g2 x plus t and let me just write the last term hm x plus t so i did the first order taylor expansion here and now i get this particular term What about, so I have max of a bunch of values. I'm going to perturb these values. Is the max going to change a lot? Not quite, okay? So what I can do is I can take the individual first order Taylor expansion here and I can still maintain the approximate equality sign. I get this as an approximation of this particular function. And remember, uh, we are only talking about D to be sufficiently small. So D is a small vector, not a very large vector. And I'm taking max of a bunch of uh, values. Now, if uh, G1 of X is very, very small, like it's strictly less than zero, G2 of X is strictly less than zero, then this term, even after you do the inner product with D, this term is also going to be very small. It's going to be less than zero, right? Because D is small. So if this term is strictly less than zero, you add something to it, most likely this term is also going to be strictly less than zero. Okay. Not the gradient. Gradient is not less than zero. I'm saying this is strictly less than zero then the sum is also likely going to be strictly less than zero. 
So, because this term is going to be small, right? It's a small perturbation. D is a small perturbation. So this term is going to be small. I mean, uh, this term is going to be small. So you add a negative value, a strictly negative value with a small value, it's going to be strictly negative. So I'm going to define J of X as the set of I'm trying to reduce the number of notation, but I guess I have to use it. So let's define G0 of x equals to 0. So it's a 0 function. And so this j should include 0. j in 0 to r such that. So j goes all the way from 0 to r, where g0 G is defined as the 0 function. And let's assume no, no equality constraint. I'm going to get the equality constraint back in a little bit. But for now, let's, uh, don't, let's not worry about the equality constraint. And then I'm going to define theta c of x d as wait ah, i see max over j J in Jx Yes. Uh, so remember, we had talked about set of active constraints, and we had denoted a of x as the set of constraints that are active at that particular point, right? G j of x equals to zero. So here we don't have G j of x equals to zero. We have G j of x equals to the penalty p of x. Okay. So the constraints that are that have the same value as the penalty at that particular point. OK, so remember p of x is defined in this way. So p of x will be, let's say, 0 0.5. The value of p of x at a point x is 0 0.5. So I'm containing all the indices here such that gj of x is equal to 0 0.5. Does that make sense? Yeah. OK. <clears throat> so whatever is the value of penalty at point x, I'm looking at the set of constraints that have exactly the same value. So gj of x is exactly equal to p of x. And I'm currently ignoring the equality constraint. I'll bring it back once I have the algorithm in place. Any other question? OK. Sorry? That is theta, yeah. That is theta c 
theta c x and d. What does that? This this value. This is uh, I'm collecting this term here and all of these terms, uh, and then taking the max over it. So this max. Uh, I'm going to pull this max outside. Let me show you what I'm trying to do. Okay, so this term doesn't depend on the indices, right? So let me let me write it as f of x plus gradient of f x transpose d plus c max over all j j equals zero to r. G J of X plus gradient G J X transpose T. So if I remove the, if I remove all of these uh, equality constraints, so I'm going to forget the equality constraint for a bit. I'm only going to cover the inequality constraint. And remember, this zero is replaced with G zero of X, which is identically equal to zero. So now I can write it in a unified format, which is C of max over all j, gj of x plus gradient of gj transpose t. Okay, I'm just uh, re-indexing a few things so that it's easier to write it on the board. Yes. So I'm taking the max. So I have max of a bunch of, I have max of x1 to xn. I'm just writing max over i, xi. It's the same thing, right? No, I'm, I'm saying like why is g1, g1 is less than 0, right? So then why is gradient of g1 transpose d plus g1 is larger than the than, than but if d is small, you can. We are looking only at perturbations around x. We are not looking at very large perturbations, small perturbations around x. Okay, and I'm saying that if this was strictly less than zero, then we expect if you add this term, it's not going to make a big difference. And remember, we are taking max of zero here. So zero. So whatever max, whatever this penalty is going to be, it's always going to be above zero. So if each of these were strictly less than zero, then only zero is the max, right? Because you can't have a value, because all of these are small perturbations. So it should be so equal to plus c into zero is because max of all of them is zero. Not all, right? So I'm looking at the entire space now. I'm not only looking at places where this is strictly less than zero. I'm looking at places everywhere in the space. Let me show you by a picture. So this is my g of x. This is my area g of x less than 0. But I could pick a point x here, which is outside the region. This is, this is unconstrained. Remember, this is unconstrained problem. So I can be here, or I can be here. If I'm here, my p of x will be greater than 0. If I'm here, my p of x will be equal to 0, because I'm taking max of g 0 and gx. This is p of x is positive. Here, p of x is equal to 0, because here, g of x is less than 0. OK? So this is, of course, in two dimension. Now I'm extending it all the way to R dimension. Any other question? So theta uh... I'll talk about theta in a bit. OK? I think this part is something that everyone understands. OK, everyone understands this equation. So I've removed h of x, and all I have done is just converted this long max equation into a something that's easy to write on the board. I 
I am going to write this equation. Let me call this equation 2. I am going to rewrite this equation to be max over j 0 to r f of x plus g j of x plus gradient of f x transpose t plus gradient of g j x transpose t. Do all of you agree that this is the same as that equation? All I have done is taken this f of x plus the gradient. Oh, I have to multiply it by c on in front. So I'll multiply it by c on in front. So all I have done is taken this term inside the maximum. c is positive. c is positive. Okay. So this is non-negative. This is non. Uh, this is non-negative and c is strictly greater than the non-negative term. So it is a positive value. So c is positive, and I'm, uh, oh, but I need to do 1 over c here. Let me see what the book has done. Oh, I see. I can multiply the c with gj itself. c here and c here. That makes it. Correct, yeah. Uh, no, I'm not assuming it to be zero. Uh, I'm just ignoring it for the time being. I'll bring it back later on. I'm just considering problem with inequality constraint right now. Just the problem with inequality constraint. But we'll bring it back. If you're maximizing over j, do you need to keep the f of x and the gradient of no, I, I, I'm trying to make a point very soon, so I'll get to it in a bit. I don't need to, but, but uh, this is another fact that we get from this particular expression, which is uh, f of x plus alpha d plus c p of x plus alpha d minus f of x minus c p of x is equal to alpha theta c x d oh i'm missing the c here can you please note down there is a c here as well there is a c here Note it down. So what I have is uh, the difference that we had started with here, f of x plus d plus c p f x plus d. Uh, I have like this f of x term and then g j of x term on this side of the equation. So now I am going to subtract this particular value with this value. Uh, and alpha is the term that I can make as small as I want to, because this is what the direction is going to be. It turns out that this particular expression, and the proof is not obvious, but basically it follows the same logic that we have been following so far. The proof is not obvious, but from this equation, and after some derivation, up, after some further derivation, you can actually show that the difference is actually exactly equal to alpha times theta of c, where theta of c is defined right here. Okay. So we wanted to find a descent direction d such that this particular statement holds. 
after going through a bunch of derivation, we have figured out that all I need to find is a descent direction d such that theta c of d is strictly less than 0. So as soon as I find a d that satisfies this, then we are in good shape. Then I can take, then that's a descent direction because then my, this side is negative and this side is very, very small. So I can pick a value of alpha according to our Mio's rule or according to whatever rule I want, uh, minimization rule, I can pick alpha and I can then descend. So what have we done so far? We had a constrained optimization problem. We added a penalty function. We figured what the first order Taylor series expansion is going to look like. So we did some approximations here. We defined this uh, theta c, quantity theta c. And then we have, I mean, we did not show it in the class, but it's there in the book. What we have identified is actually this difference is exactly equal to this value, plus a small error term. And so I want to find a d such that theta c of d is strictly less than 0. So that's our new problem. I'll pause here for a bit. If there are any questions, please let me know now. And now the next obvious question is, how do I find a d such that this particular statement holds? How should we do that? Let's think about it. So I have a whole bunch of max here. I have max over these set of equations. Max of x is already used. Let's use y. So I have max of y1 and y2. Can I write it as min of c, y1 less than equals to c, and y2 less than equals to c? Are these two things equal? What's the minimum value of c such that y1 is smaller than c and y2 is also smaller than c? Okay, so that's just the max of the two variables. What do I have here? I have max of a bunch of functions in equation two. So what should I do? I can convert this. So I want to find a d. I want to find a d that minimizes this particular term, this big term. Everybody understands this. So now I'm going to give you the sequential quadratic programming algorithm. So I want to minimize gradient fx transpose d plus half d transpose hd plus c times c such that gjx plus gradient gjx transpose t is less than equal to c for all j 0 to r. And I just want to put a note here j equals to 0 implies c is greater than or equal to 0. And this minimization is over x and c.
And it turns out that the optimal solution to this will satisfy So if D star is the optimal solution, oh, this minimum is over all D, D star. So if D star is the optimal solution, then we know that this particular term is strictly less than this. If D star is a non-zero vector, then this is strictly less than zero. Okay. So let me go back to uh, what we did. So we started with a constrained optimization problem. We converted it into an unconstrained problem, but with a penalty function. Then we did the first order Taylor expansion. Uh, and of course, we have done a lot of approximations here. We have done an approximation here. We have done an approximation here. And then I get to this particular problem statement. From this problem statement, I have uh, come to this problem statement where this max is over a whole bunch of expression. Uh, and then I try to come up with this difference, and I realize that actually this difference is given by this expression. So all I care about is this theta c, I want it to be strictly less than zero. Then I'm in the right descent direction. Then I came up with a quadratic programming problem. So h is a positive definite matrix, as has been the case throughout our discussion. So h is some positive definite matrix. And then I, if I solve this problem, uh, where I had this max over j term right here. So instead of putting max over j term right here, I did c of c, and then I added this whole bunch of constraint less than or equal to c. And then the result that I have is, actually if I solve this problem and get d star, it turns out that this particular term is strictly less than equal to this, this uh, value which is strictly less than zero because d star is a non-zero non -zero value, unless you are at the optimal solution. If you are at the optimal solution, then d star will be equal to zero, at which point you don't have a descent direction. You are at the optimal solution. So as long as your d star is non-zero, you're always going to descend for this particular uh, function. OK. Uh, yes. How did I go from here to here? From here? So f of x is f of x is not dependent on the d at all. So I don't have to do the if I'm doing the minimization over d, I can remove all the terms that don't depend on d. Right? Yes. This one or this one? This one? This is just to make sure that this has a valid solution. Remember, even in uh, manifold suboptimization method and many other methods, we have used a quadratic function to make sure that the problem is well posed. It doesn't have d equals to minus infinity as a solution, for instance. Right? It allows us to compute a specific D star by adding a positive definite matrix here. That's where the quadratic programming terminology Yeah, exactly. That's where the quadratic programming terminology comes in. So this is linear in D. This is just a constant. Uh, this is C, but this appears on this side. So this is linear in D and C. This is quadratic in D, but it is linear in C. And then you have this linear function of D. So all in all, you have 
linear terms, quadratic terms, and linear set of inequalities. And therefore, you can solve it very efficiently using what? Using manifold suboptimization method, right? So in manifold suboptimization method, we were trying to solve problems of this type. Linear function with, no, quadratic function with linear constraints, right? Correct. You just use quadprog and it'll do the job in MATLAB or in uh, SciPy. You've already used it in assignment two, I think, right? Yeah, so you will use assignment two quadprog to solve this particular problem because it's a very simple quadratic program. So we started with, an uh, we, with a constraint problem. We converted it into a sequence of quadratic program and we can solve that particular program to get the value of dk at every point of time. What is still open? What, what is something we still don't know? No, we still don't know what the value of c should be. Why did, why did we forget the equality? Oh yeah, equality also, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about it in a bit. So the way to handle the equality constraint is you, uh, so absolute value of hx, well, let me add the equality constraint also, and then I'll, I'll tell you what to do with that constraint. Yeah, let me add the equality constraint now. So hi of x plus gradient of hi of x transpose d is less than or equal to c for all i equals 1 to m. But this is not something we studied in quad prog, right? How do I convert this into linear constraints? This, this is something MATLAB cannot handle. MATLAB doesn't allow you to put absolute value in the constraint. Yeah, so you can do hi of x plus gradient hi of x transpose d less than equal to psi and then minus hi of x minus so the plus value has to be less than equal to c and the minus value also has to be less than equal to c so you get the same result In other words, you are treating equality constraint as two inequality constraints. Hi of x less than or equal to zero and minus Hi of x less than or equal to zero. That's how you are solving problems of this type. So that was the reason I removed all the equality constraint. So now we can bring it back by just replacing Hi of x with plus Hi of x and then minus Hi of x. That solves our problem. Any other question? So I still don't know what value of C I need to pick because this is the first time I'm seeing the optimization problem. I don't know what the value of C should be. So here is what we will do. So we'll pick X naught. And I'm going to solve the following problem. I cannot write this optimization problem again and again. What should I do? Uh, I need to give it a sh short form. Okay, let me call this, let me call the solution of this problem as solution at x c
So my solution SOL at X and C and that's it, right? Those are the only two parameters here. S and C, okay. This is equal to D star, C star, mu one star, mu zero star, all the way up to mu r star. And then let me just keep all the, only the inequality constraint because now you know how to solve the equality constraint problem. So I'm giving it a name. The solution at point X and the value C is going to be, going to give me an output of D star, C star, so optimal solution for D, optimal solution for C, and all the Lagrange multipliers corresponding to these inequality constraints. And I'm going to remove all the equality constraints again because you know how to handle them. So this is my output. So I'm going to pick x naught, and I'm going to pick get d0 star, c0 star, mu0 zero, 0 star, mu1 0 star, mu r0 star. So I'm going to remove, I'm going to set C equals to zero also. Actually, this needs to be also equal to zero because I don't have any multiplier with C. So I'm going to replace the C with zero, okay? So this C will be zero and this C will be replaced with zero as well. So this one is set to zero, this one is set to zero, this one is set to zero at the first instance, the first time I'm solving it. And then I'm going to define C0 to be greater than maybe I'll some positive number gamma plus summation mu0 j star j equals 1 to r, j equals 0 to r. Gamma is strictly positive. So this gives me the first estimate of C0, okay, first ever estimate of C0. And then I do X1 equals to X0 plus alpha 0 D0 star. I get the D0 star from there. And then get D1 star C1 star solve x1, c0. c0 comes from here. And keep going on and on until you converge. I have the problem min of fx gx less than equal to h of x equal to zero. I'm going to solve it by solving min of fx g of x less than equal to zero, h of x less than equal to zero, minus h of x less than equal to zero. So I start with this, so now I only have inequality constraint, and then I use this algorithm 
to solve the problem sequentially. Even though I do not know what the value of C should be, because I don't know what the Lagrange multipliers are going to be, but I can still apply that algorithm because it allows us to come up with a first estimate of C, which then I can continue to use throughout the optimization algorithm. Okay, so this is known as sequential quadratic programming. You start with this problem, you come up with a sequence of quadratic programs, and you solve those quadratic programs, update the two parameters, C naught, I mean the C is something that you need to update at every time step, and then you get D naught as a solution, and you have to pick alpha naught according to whatever is your favorite method for picking alpha naught, and then you can continue to solve this problem. So this is known as sequential quadratic program. Okay. Any questions? Yes. Will the Lagrange multipliers also converge to the optimal? Yes, they will. So as D star becomes smaller and smaller, you will see that the Lagrange multipliers are going to converge to something. Yeah, the Lagrange multipliers will also converge to the optimal solution. All of the derivation, I mean, all of the proofs are there in the book. But uh, we are not covering that in the class. Any other question? OK, awesome. So that's all I have for today. In the next class, which is on Monday, uh, we're going to talk about some other form of penalty method. And uh, in particular, we'll talk about contraction mapping theorem, which is a very useful tool. We'll use it again when we are doing dynamic optimization. So we'll talk about contraction mapping theorem and how it is used to prove convergence of algorithms. And in particular, how would it, how would it be used to prove convergence of a penalty method that we'll be talking about in the next class. OK, thank you. Just give me a second, let me put that off.